I'm very pleased to be asked to come and speak with you today. And as the last speaker, as several people have said before, a lot has been already said. We've come to the end of a full day and a half of considering the quality of life at the end of life. And it has definitely been an interesting discussion. It's been very inspiring for me to participate and listen to the many speakers. Um, initially, I had planned to cover recommendations and strategies, but I think that Pierre has already covered very practical day-to-day -day things, and Carolyn has talked about the policy issues. So what I decided to do was to take a slightly different tack. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Caregivers Association of British Columbia. It was founded in 1993, and its focus is to provide support and care to caregivers and their family members throughout the journey of caregiving. We do this with 50 affiliated groups around the province, and we do provide education and support both via telephone and on the internet. The recent Stats Canada survey says that caregivers want to care for their family members, but they need the support to do it. They need the support in whatever way they ask for that support. And they know their family member better than most healthcare professionals that will be involved. So it makes sense to speak with the caregiver and the family when dealing with end of life issues. One in five people are caring at this point in time, and they provide about 6%, about uh, 700,000 unpaid dollars of care mm -hmm. er annually in British Columbia, which is 6% of our health care budget. What caregivers are asking for is recognition that they can be a part of the process. They're asking for flexible home care and support. They're asking for the ability to reach out, and we know that if they know there's somebody there to talk to, that caregiving can be a very rewarding experience. So part of planning an end-of-life care is to look at the rewards and to make sure that we can speak with each other on a human level to provide the care for people who are dying. I'm going to take the liberty to distill some of the ideas that you have brought up over the last day and a half, um, just as a way to give us a focus for what we have set here as a group and where we can go in the future. The speakers, the speakers and participants have given us many different points of view, and Paul Spears outlined the social, legal, and legislative challenges of making changes to our society to allow each individual to make choices around their own deaths. The feeling of choice and control are both well-known facilitators of psychological health, and I think that's one of the things that people are asking for, to know that they have choices and that they have some control. He spoke of increasing the legal rights and responsibilities of individuals in their own death, and he highlighted the need for safeguards and the difference between suicide and the choice to die. He highlighted how technology has given us the power to create a living grave, and he asked if this was something that we really want in our society. Duncan Robertson and Charmaine Spencer spoke of health care support in helping people with planning and the importance of interpreting the decisions that we make and speaking with each other to make sure that the interpretations are as close to what the person wanted as possible. And Alistair Brown, our philosopher, cautioned us that the tools that we create may not always create the outcomes that we intend, and that they can be a double-edged sword. So we have to be careful and be aware that the tools and the policies that we do develop will have strengths and weaknesses built right into them, and it's important for us to be aware of that. Dr. Kuhl presented the stories and wishes of a few souls who have gone ahead of us. He broadened the discussion from medical and physical to psychological and spiritual dimensions, and he spoke of the challenges of reducing unintended harm by healthcare professionals and how we can ameliorate that through listening. He spoke of the challenges of helping people who are at end of life to deal with hopelessness, loneliness, and boredom. David Jackson reminded us that the impact of killing does not end with the death and Roger Nelson noted that the medical code of ethics does allow some choices in adequate care. 
Ruth von Fuchs spoke with awareness, about awareness of our assumptions and how they shape our decisions. And I heard one woman yesterday say her opinion that the loss of dignity when, when living in a care facility equaled the loss of meaning of life for her. And it's important that we continue to talk so that we know what our assumptions are. Barry Wolsfeld pointed out the danger of defining others' lives through our own eyes. And I think, if anything, that one point summarizes what we talked about here, that we can, should be aware of the danger of defining other people's lives through our own eyes. So what were all of the speakers trying to get at? They were talking about a vision of a good death. And nobody really defined a good death, except that it was defined in everything that we said. And this was what I came up with in summarizing what you have said in defining a good death. A good death is involved in the art of living. It encompasses what it means to be human. It means saying goodbye. It means celebrating, acknowledging that life is altered, both for the person who dies and for the family that is left behind. It is courage. It is competent care, compassion, love, hope. It is peaceful, comfort, purpose to our days, not shameful but a natural part of living. It involves indiv individualized advocacy, it involves remembrance, and it is person-centered. It involves the right to have a direct say. It has caring built into it. It has joy, it has sadness, it has mystery, it is precious, it is a gift to others, it has faith, support, it is profound, it is not being abandoned in the cycle of life. It includes self-determination, it includes listening and letting go. It includes participating and discussing, glorifying life, doing no harm, empowerment, managing pain, working with the whole being and understanding, knowing that things go beyond words, making wise choices with integrity and imagination. Those are all things that came directly from what people said yesterday and today. And I think they are very valuable for us in moving forward. When, when we're considering end-of-life choices. All voices need to be heard and validated. The individual, the key person, is the person who is dying, but I disagree with others that everyone around them are just observers. The people around them are integrating their own experiences, and these people include the family with their love, their knowledge, their conflict, their roles, and their dynamics. They include the community, both institutional and informal. And if these voices are not heard, then the individual gets lost before they die as well as after they die. And this in ultimately is dehumanizing to all of us. The issues that also came out were things such as, this is an existential issue. It is an issue of facing fear. It is an issue of facing our own deaths. It is a power issue of who makes the decisions, whether death is medicalized or whether it is considered a part of the life cycle. It is also a matter of the interplay of systems and the needs of these different systems. Do the needs of our healthcare system supersede the need of the individual? And is it absolutely necessary that these two things be in conflict with each other? The need of the society at large is for the bottom line. It's for efficiency. It includes some bureaucracy and service to its citizens. And the need of the person who's dying in their families might be different. They may include such things as time to be together, time to go through the process, and to experience the living and death. So we need to find creative ways to integrate the needs of these two different systems. We heard stories yesterday about how the system sometimes works very well. We heard stories yesterday about how the system sometimes lets people down in awful ways. And we also heard stories about sometimes how the system supports people, but the experience itself is difficult. 
And that is something to also be aware of. Our expectations, what are our ideals? That we need to work to create something that works for everyone to the best of our ability, but we know that it won't be perfect. It will be part of life, part of what we do to communicate one to another. So I'm going to, if I can find the right page, I must not have it here, but my call to action was basically that when we come down to what we're doing on a policy level, when we come down to what we're doing on a financial level, when we come down to what we're doing on a family systems level and a societal level, it, we need to remember that working with someone who is dying, walking with someone through the process of death, is always a matter of working one human being to another. And uh, Thomas Moore is an archetypal psychologist, and one of his quotes, which I was going to read to you today, involves the idea that we come into life as an individual original soul, as an individual self. And that self is born to be joyful and to express itself throughout its life. And I think one of our challenges today and in the future is to take that idea that we are each unique individual souls and to apply that to the dying process so that we don't forget that we're sitting one human being to another. At this point in my life, I've experienced death twice in my family. I've experienced death many times in my community. I grew up in a religious community, my father was a minister and I went to many funerals. But I did not experience death really in the same way until it came to my own family. Up until that time, it was a service. It was a way of providing something to the community at large to provide healing. But when my grandfather died last September, he was 94 years old and he died very peacefully. My aunt is currently in the hospital She's 52 years old, dying of a very quick neurological illness, and it is not going to be a peaceful death for her. So what we need to do is to remember to be there one to another, to support the soul that is dying, and to support that at all levels of what we do in our personal and our professional practice. I also know that in our society, Many people um, walk away from death. There's a story of a person on a boat. The boat's heading in the direction that it needs to go. It's going to get there inevitably. And the person is walking as fast as they can towards the back of the boat. And this is typically how our society deals with death. But what I have seen here in the last day and a half are people who are facing forward, people who are walking towards the front of the boat, People who are saying, how can I integrate the movement of this boat and my life and the life of those around me into something that can be shaped into something meaningful and purposeful. So I commend you for that. And I wish you the best in what you do in your personal and professional life as you continue to struggle and work through the issues of quality of life at the end of dying. Thank you.